thanks to all of you who have joined us by webinar. And also, of course, thanks to the presenters who will be here. Um, today's webinar is on the market develop, uh, well, this is a joint webinar with both the um, Maternal Health Caucus as well as the Market Development Approaches Working Group. And today we wanted to go through uh, the business cases for investing in the production of high quality maternal health commodities. Um, Japigo, uh, along with some partners uh, and with funding with the Reproductive Health Supplies Coalition, was able to fulfill and complete three business cases uh, for maternal health commodities, that is oxytocin, mesoprostol, and magnesium sulfate. And today's uh, webinar will, will be about uh, describing both the methodology and also explaining uh, what are the conclusions that came from that. We have uh, with us, we have Selena Shokin, who is a senior technical advisor here at Japigo. Um, she is the one who uh, took on the majority of the work in order to wrestle the data that we had into these three commodity business cases. And she will be uh, spending some time, about 30 minutes, going through the methodology and all of the, um, uh, the, the results. In addition, um, in an effort to connect these analyses with some broader coalition-led market shaping efforts, we have Caitlin Christensen, who's a strategy advisor at PATH, and she will be able to talk a little bit about how uh, business cases such as these will be able to fit into some broader coalition-wide efforts. My name is Deetsi Tanuku. I'm the program director for uh, the USAID-funded Accelerate program, which is focused on increasing access to global health technologies and commodities in low-resource settings. Um, so I just want to get started with uh, understanding or starting from our common set of understanding, which is uh, those of us who work in this field, and many of us on this uh, webinar must know and must have heard by now the, the common story that comes with commodities, which is we know that there is, um, uh, we often get told that these commodities aren't commercially viable enough for, for the markets to bridge gaps in terms of making sure that we have high quality goods at low prices and universal access. And I've, you know, written some of the arguments up here as they pertain to magnesium sulfate just to join, just to uh, set the stage for some of the factors that we're working with here, which include the fact that we are working with commodities that are low price, usually give very low margins, and given the fact that we're working with maternal health uh, populations, uh, the volumes are not nearly as large as dealing with, let's say, a drug which is uh, used for all adults, uh, not just pregnant women. Of course, we have problems with uncertainty and demand. We have some problems on the supply side. On We have some uh, problems with uh, understanding what the, um, what the market risk is for the various stakeholders. Um, and all of this can lead to a common effect that we're seeing in the field, which is a one of two scenarios. Either there is not universal access, or uh, we have access but, uh, uh, but low quality uh, commodities. And so our, our main uh, effort to do these um, business cases was to show and to prove that if we put a little bit of time and effort and investment, uh, both the global community as well as manufacturers, uh, as well as country governments, and set up a market shaping structure such that we can make sure we prioritize quality, that in fact that such a thing can happen and that we can uh, get these three commodities out. Um, I wanted, I'm, I'm, some of you may have uh, gone to Mexico City and we have also heard that we are, um, there was a clear call for integration between maternal and reproductive health supplies and there we talked a lot about using the efforts within the coalition as a platform to set joint priorities and how we want to combine market intelligence for both supplies 
But the third one is also very important, which is we want to talk about market shaping, supply and product innovations, just trying to make sure that when we consider doing this for reproductive health supplies, we also consider the cases for maternal health commodities. Um, with that, uh, as I just want to show you, these are the three cases that we're talking about. Well, Selena will uh, go through each of um, the top line findings for each of the three of them. But they are uh, available online right now. Those are the links that are there. You can also get them off of going on the Japido Accelerate website. And uh, all three of them are ready. Also ready is a uh, forecasting guide um, for market assessment. Actually, <clears throat> it's more called a user guide for market assessment, um, and which you can download and use yourself. Uh, Selena will also talk a little bit about that. Um, I also just wanted to close and say, uh, while a lot of this has been done with gener generous funding from the Reproductive Health Supplies Coalition, um, some of the background market assessment uh, uh, spreadsheet development, as well as the first iteration of uh, the mesopostal business case was done under the USAID Accelerate Award, um, which is a five-year award part of the USA's health to research health research program, which is focused on bridging the research to use gap for technologies. Um, and so this is a little bit about uh, the Accelerate program. Um, with that, uh, I would like to turn this over to Selena. And Selena will go through for 30 minutes the details of the case. Great. Thank you very much, DG. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. Uh, I hope that those of you that were in the path of the storm last night and into today are staying warm. Um, we'll try to give you some interesting things to keep you occupied away from the blizzard. And I'd like to thank the Reproductive Health Supplies Coalition Milka, Jamie, and Anita for organizing this. Uh, really looking forward to sharing our results uh, of these business cases with you today. So our terms of reference was to understand the market dynamics for all three drugs, oxytocin, magnesium sulfate, and mesoprostol. Of course, oxytocin and mesoprostol for the use of prevention and treatment of postpartum hemorrhage, and magnesium sulfate for the treatment of severe preeclampsia and eclampsia. As Deep T pointed out, uh, our funding for this was from the Reproductive Health Supplies Coalition through PATH, and also for the mesoprostol work, we had additional funding from USAID through Accelivate. And as Deep T already showed you, we have already uh, published these cases. We have them published and on our website in, uh, in English, French, and Spanish. Uh, for those of you um, who, who prefer other languages, we do have the French and Spanish. Uh, and what we also have put up is what's called a maternal health drug business assessment. And what we did is we created a, a series of spreadsheets trying to model out what the uh, demand is for all three of these products. There's a number of uh, assumptions that we made in trying to understand the size of the market, how much of the drug is being used, and what the needs are for these drugs in every country. And of course, we don't have time today to go through all of the country level assessments. We're going to be showing you uh, some regional assessments. Um, but these assessments and the Excel uh, spreadsheet, which you can download, that has a guide as well, uh, is done in such a way that anyone can download this and using the guide you would be able to adjust assumptions as well. So we have some model countries that we have modeled out such as Ethiopia, Kenya, Bangladesh, and some others, uh, but it would be very easy to model uh, our assumptions for other countries as well or for different regions or to, for example, say, um, you know, if you disagree with or want to see what would happen if the prevalence of postpartum hemorrhage is different from what we have, uh, what we have assumed from the research. Uh, all of these things are dynamic and can be uh, adjusted. So uh, digging into the, the research and what we found, uh, with 
Oxytocin, and I understand that many of you are very familiar with all three of these products, so I will go through them quickly. Um, and, and I also know that some of you will have seen parts of this presentation before, but we definitely added some new things as well for those of you that saw the presentation in Mexico City. Um, for oxytocin, there are real challenges in procuring high-quality products. Uh, it is a high-volume product. Oxytocin should be administered to every woman who delivers a baby to prevent postpartum hemorrhage. Um, and then there is a, a treatment as well for women who have postpartum hemorrhage, which leads to quite high volume. Uh, there are many manufacturers making the drugs, upwards of 500 manufacturers. And at this time, there are no WHO pre-qualified products available. It is a price-sensitive market because many of the procurers are ministries of health. They have to procure a high volume, so they are interested in procuring at the lowest cost possible. And up until recently, there wasn't as much realization about the uh, quality concerns with oxytocin. For oxytocin, there's concerns about the manufacturing process because we do lack certain information about it. Certainly some manufacturers produce high quality, but some we don't know. There's also concern about the finished pharmaceutical product or the, the actual oxytocin degrading as it moves down this uh, supply chain. In many cases, it is not kept in the cold chain, and there is low awareness for now about keeping oxytocin in the cold chain. There are some recent studies in Ghana, Indonesia, and elsewhere that indicate there are some very serious problems with quality, and we need more research to be done to understand those quality issues. For mesoprostol, we studied uh, only the, um, the use of mesoprostol for postpartum hemorrhage. We did not go into other uses of mesoprostol. The challenges in some ways are similar of many manufacturers limited WHO pre-qualified products. Um, the product is available for between 15 cents and 48 cents, uh, but in fact you need about three uh, tablets for one preventative dose of mesoprostol and four tablets uh, for a treatment dose. There's also a lot of different obstetric indications and as well non-obstetric indications, so the drug is often being used in an off-label way. There are some increasing concerns about quality. Uh, the product can deteriorate, particularly if it's not properly packaged. Uh, there's also some concerns, although a limited amount of evidence so far, about counterfeits. So uh, more research is done to understand the quality challenges, or more research needs to be done to understand those quality challenges. For magnesium sulfate, there's a number of different challenges. A low usage rate by health workers, because it's a confusing uh, treatment regimen. There's a number of different treatment regimens. There has not been enough training for many health workers. Uh, and it is also a somewhat challenging drug to administer that often requires uh, different doses at different times and some mixing of solutions. This is very doable, but in many cases health workers have some concerns or don't feel adequately trained. The drug is not difficult to manufacture, uh, but it is important, of course, to make sure that it's sterile. Uh, and at this point, there are no WHO pre-qualified products. The prices also range quite considerably, from about 50 cents to $1.60 for one 10 milliliter ampule. Uh, but you would need multiple ampules to treat one case of preeclampsia. So with the WHO pre-qualification, this is not necessarily required uh, for the procurement of these products, but it is a very strong signal that uh, uh, it's a very strong signal to a procurer that is a high quality product. For magnesium sulfate, there are no WHO pre-qualified products, and you can see that there's a limited number for oxytocin and for mesoprostol. Uh, procurers could also get information about uh, the quality of the product by using only stringent regulatory authority approved drugs um, or by doing some sort of a very rigorous quality assurance process. But WHO pre-qualification is one very good way to signal the quality of the product. 
So digging into the data, and I'm going to show you an awful lot of numbers today, uh, apologies in advance. Um, all of this information can be downloaded in our reports and in those Excel tables, so you don't need to worry too much. Um, and we can also see about posting this presentation later. But to understand the world market for oxytocin, uh, if we start over on the very far right side, these smaller boxes, this will be the market for the active management of the third stage of labor, which is our proxy for women who have gotten care uh, in a health facility where oxytocin is unavailable. In some health centers, it is not available. Moving over one bar um, to the orange and blue, is the total market that is currently available for oxytocin for prevention and treatment. Prevention is on the bottom, the treatment is on the top. And I would point out that while the number is 9.7 million uh, treatment cases, there's actually a, uh, you require four doses of oxytocin or four ampules of oxytocin for a treatment dose. So the number of, actu of, of actual ampules required is quite a bit higher. Moving over to the, uh, the green and yellow, the third um, bar from the right, is the total market that does not have access uh, to active management of the third stage of labor. This is the market that is currently uh, getting access or might use uh, mesoprostol because oxytocin is not used outside of health facilities. Women who do not deliver in a health facility should be getting uh, mesoprostol instead. And then the bar over on the far left is the total addressable market uh, for oxytocin. So uh, the, the current size of the market, uh, the number of cases for both prevention and treatment. And, uh, and then that shows us the, uh, the size of the market, assuming a 15 cent uh, low cost per ampule and a 20 cent high cost. We see that the global market is $34 million up to about $45.8 million for oxytocin. Moving on to mesoprostol, and an important caveat here is that this is the world market for mesoprostol for prevention and treatment. There are many other uses for mesoprostol, and we did not model those out. You could use the uh, Excel tables that we have done uh, to add in additional use cases, but we have not done that here. Uh, so on the very far right is the total market for mesoprostol. These are the women that are delivering in communities that don't have access to oxytocin. Moving one bar over is the market for women who deliver in health facilities that don't have oxytocin uh, and who are provided mesoprostol. Uh, this, uh, the third bar over from the right is the market uh, for women who are getting oxytocin. And again, on the far left, the total addressable market. We would hope that, in fact, more women have increased access to oxytocin uh, for prevention and treatment of postpartum hemorrhage. So we don't want to move in the direction of the total addressable market for mesoprostol because wherever possible, women should be delivering in a health facility and have access, access to oxytocin. So the total market size for mesoprostol prevention and treatment uh, at the very upper limits uh, globally are between 25 and 80 million dollars. These numbers become quite high because, again, as I pointed out earlier, you need between three and four tablets of mesoprostol uh, per treatment case. Well, uh, it's three tablets for prevention and four tablets for treatment. And again, you can see here how that breaks out into the size by region. In terms of a difference between the South Asia and Southeast Asia, in case you're wondering, uh, South Asia does include uh, some, some high, highly populous countries uh, such as India and Bangladesh. Southeast Asia uh, is uh, more countries further east, the Philippines, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, uh, and, and countries around there. For magnesium sulfate, as we pointed out, it is a bit challenging to model out the cost and the size of the market because there are so many different variations. We have assumed a 10 milliliter ampule. There are also 5 milliliter ampules and 20 milliliter ampules available, but it's the 5 gram and 10 ml that is on the WHO's essential medicines list. So we have used that one to model out the cost. And cost is between 50 cents and $1.60. Now, there are different treatment regimens. Pritchard's and Zespin's are the most common. There are low-dose uh, regimens that are used in some countries, such as Bangladesh. The cost would be between $3 and 
for the medicine for magnesium sulfate uh, in total. This does not include the costs of um, of additional um, of additional equipment needed, such as um, a solution to dilute uh, the magnesium sulfate in some cases. So that it would be a little bit more expensive once you add in those additional costs. So the total addressable market varies quite a bit depending on the regimen that's used uh, and depending upon the cost. Uh, so we found that there's actually a really significant range. As you can see globally, it's between about $4.3 million using the lowest cost estimates and the lower dose regimen of Zespin going up to about $51 million using the higher cost estimate uh, with Pritchard's regimen. So with all of this information, we try to understand uh, how could we incentivize manufacturers to improve the quality or to demonstrate the quality of their drugs and to incentivize procurers, who are mostly ministries of health in the case of these uh, products, to procure high quality products. Right now, ministries of health in some cases are not aware of these quality issues and it's important that we, uh, that we you know, raise awareness about that so that they make sure that they're procuring a higher quality product. The current state of the market is really that we have two different types of markets. In market A, we have many manufacturers that have a high, high uh, amount of the volume. They sell a low uh, cost product and we don't know what the quality is. That is not to say that the quality is necessarily poor, but it hasn't been evaluated. In market B, we have a much smaller number of manufacturers that have a smaller part of the volume of the market that are selling a more expensive product and that is quality assured. We know that the quality of that product is good. So we propose a number of different uh, policy uh, approaches. This would be encouraging uh, the use of pre-qualification that uh, manufacturers would go through pre-qualification or some other way of test of proving quality, such as stringent regulatory authority approval, uh, that uh, procurers, such as ministries of health and others, only procure qualified uh, and high quality products, uh, that there be much more testing of drugs to, so that we know what the quality is and that we can identify problems as they arise. And what will happen through that process is a transition phase where some procurers and ministries of health will begin transitioning towards the quality assured products. There will be a smaller number of manufacturers that are going to manufacture the unknown quality products. They will still have market, uh, market size uh, because it will take time to get the information out and to transition many procurers um, away from these products of unknown quality because, of course, the cost is, is better and it's what they're doing now. But over time, it will be transitioning towards uh, these more, slightly more expensive uh, quality assured products that will increase the size of the market. And what we would like to move to then is a final stage in which case all of the market is procuring a quality product, we will have a higher number of manufacturers. So some of these manufacturers of unknown quality will go through the process to demonstrate the quality of their product. Those that cannot do that, that do not make a quality product, will drop away because they will not have a market for their products. Because there will be more manufacturers that are selling this higher quality product, the cost will decrease. Uh, so it will stabilize uh, somewhere in between the, the current prices. Uh, and that is, that's where we would like to get to in the market shaping approach for these drugs. In order to do that, we need to incentivize manufacturers to improve the quality uh, of their products. So there's a number of different incentives depending on the type of manufacturer. For a large generic manufacturer, they really want to be seen in many cases as a good corporate citizen. In many cases, they already have a number of products that have gone through pre-qualification. They may have ACTs, antiretrovirals, antibiotics, or other drugs that have gone through pre-qualification. And they may want to present a complete basket of products. 
So even if they don't view maternal health products as a great financial investment, it could be very good for them to have that com uh, complete basket of products. They know that there's support available from the Concept Foundation and others to go through the pre-qualification process that they can take advantage of. And if they have already uh, equipped their uh, factories and their um, processing um, uh, their, their procedures to go through pre-qualification, it might be an incremental investment for them uh, to go through a pre-qualification process. For the smaller manufacturers, uh, they know that technical assistance is available. They, uh, they know that they could increase uh, the new purchasers and get some new buyers of their products. And they may be afraid of other competitors going through a quality assurance process. Uh, but we do need to make sure that, especially for these manufacturers, if they go through a quality uh, uh, assurance process, that we're prepared to procure their products. Otherwise, they've gone through this process, uh, and it might incrementally increase the price of their products, and then they can't sell them. So we need to be sure that we are really um, procuring at that point. And for local and regional manufacturers, they may also be interested in this technical assistance and having validation from international bodies in diversifying the procurers of their products and in improving their reputation. Through all of our work, uh, there is, in fact, so much to be done. And I know that many of you that are on the phone call today are involved in doing that. Uh, I've listed some of the most urgent needs, and, and there are many, uh, for oxytocin. Uh, we need to continue the cold chain work of getting oxytocin to be stored in the cold chain and changing policies where needed so that that can be done. There are a number of issues around labeling of oxytocin. There's different labeling, um, so it's confusing to health workers and um, procurement groups of how to store oxytocin, and that needs to be sorted out. For all three drugs, oxytocin, mesoprostol, and magnesium sulfate, we need to have more assessments of the quality of these drugs to understand where there are quality issues uh, and, and where those problems are occurring. Availability of all three drugs continues to be a challenge. For magnesium sulfate, we need to clarify the formulation for procurement and clarify the WHO's essential medicine list. Uh, there's also the need to place these products uh, on essential medicines lists for countries in many cases. Some countries have done this, some have further work to do. Uh, and then increasing the number of formulations uh, on the WHO pre-qualified list. If there are more pre-qualified products available, uh, that will make it easier for procurers uh, to purchase those products. So in conclusion, uh, I, I've already shown you many of the numbers. I don't want to go through and read them all again, um, but you can see that there is, um, there, there's quite a large market size for all of these products, uh, concerns about quality that I've mentioned. We believe that there will be uh, an increasing demand for all three of these products uh, as we work to increase access to them. Uh, and. Um, it really does require action from so many different stakeholders. Uh, there's many of you on the call are involved in this, but we really all need to work together uh, to increase access to the high quality versions of these products, which are so important. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, there's many, many people that were involved in developing these business cases. In particular, I'd like to thank Milka uh, and Beth Yeager and Hans Weimer uh, many, many people were involved, and we really appreciate it. Um, the, uh, the business cases can be found here at this website. Uh, and with that, uh, I, will, um, I will turn over the microphone. Okay, um, so now I, we have Caitlin Christensen. And Caitlin will be talking about the broader picture of advocacy and market shaping efforts. Um, so, Caitlin, go ahead. Wonderful. Thanks so much. And um, I'll reiterate the good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Um, so first, just an introduction to me. I'm Caitlin Christensen, and I serve as a strategy advisor to PATH, which includes a number of different functions, but notably for this discussion, helping to support the growth of more of a market dynamic practice at PATH and overseeing a newly granted award from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation 
to conduct advocacy around market dynamics. So I wanted to walk you all through a fairly high level introduction to the scope of work that we'll be doing under that grant with a few caveats. One, that we intend to hire a full-time person who will lead on this work and we're in that recruitment process. And the second, that once that person is on board, we'll initially start with narrowing the focus um, of that effort. But really excited to be able to speak with this group today who I think will be key partners in this effort. So first, just by way of background, um, the, the goal for our, for our effort is to advocate both at the global and to some extent, and increasingly so over the course of this three-year grant at a national level for solutions that are focused on strong, healthy markets in an effort to evolve some of the dialogue that happens around product access to cover a full range of, of market issues. Um, and that work will target both at the global level and in select countries where past advocacy team has a more deep presence. Um, policy influencers, donors, advocates, activists, as well as implementers, with the idea that we would create, um, build an evidence base or at, at minimum um, provide greater access to the evidence base that's been developed by key groups like those just presented, um, some aligned messages, messaging, and then more political will to strengthen support around healthy markets. Um, our focus in this work is around women's and children's health products and commodities. So to, to dive more specifically, there are really two different approaches we're taking. So one at the global level, as I described around shifting this dialogue on access um, and ensuring that as we're talking about access to health products for women and children, we as activists and as advocates are focusing on the full scope of market shortcomings and talking about the importance of long-term healthy markets. And so a, a few of the key outcomes that we're seeking to a, address are First, developing an advocacy framework that would be based on some of the market shaping, market strengthening frameworks done by others. So, you know, from the recently released primer from USA to work that's been done by these other groups here. Um, and that this advocacy framework would outline the components of healthy markets for health products and with a focus on the types of policy solutions and opportunities, then that could serve as more of a platform or agenda for advocate. Um, a second piece is that we have generated an advocacy dialogue around flexible and improved procurement practices and that we are actively sharing those messages and advocating with major buyers. And then a third is that key activists and particularly those who are in high profile spots with, with key decision makers or who are occupying seats um, on board delegations with multilateral procurement organizations broaden some of their discussion around access to include market dynamics approaches and discuss market solutions. And then, so that was our global focused work. And then um, as we, we like to get more specific around two to three discrete women's and children's health product areas. Um, and I think initially as we start this work, we'll be doing assessments both surveying literature, talking with advocates, and um, looking at the technical evidence base that's been created, as well as talking internally at PATH with key stakeholders here to understand two things. Um, one is where are there the most critical market shortcomings that need to be addressed? And then a second layer of analysis is where can advocacy really be the most effective tool? Because we know that those two things don't always match up. So using those as a framework to help us narrow down our focus. In this space, we would look to first identify what the gaps in market interventions for maternal newborn child health products are um, and share and communicate about those with key stakeholders. And then build political will around addressing market barriers through policy and advocacy solutions for those two to three health products and strengthen that will um, and with evidence provided by various groups, advocates, influencers, and decision makers, commitments around mar market strengthening activities. Um, thirdly, to improve collaboration and transparency among key stakeholders in the market dynamic space, um, as well as and specifically including alignment of different advocacy activities and strategies. 
Third, that we would look for um, more of an uptake of ongoing market dynamics work across those different focus areas, strengthening that and accelerating it, both globally and then within, within the selected target countries where we would, we would work. And then finally, um, and aligned with this earlier piece, adoption of key messages and advocacy goals around um, key issues like improved procurement practice, regulatory efforts, um, and other guidelines. So in terms of our near-term steps and, and next pieces, so obviously recruiting a person to lead this effort, um, but really the big, the big starting point for us will be conducting a landscaping literature review and discussions with key stakeholders in this space to identify, as I noted, those priority areas for focus based on where there are gaps and needs and where there are key opportunities for advocacy. And then next, using that information to develop more of an advocacy framework and, and messaging base that outline the importance of healthy marketplace and the, the need for long-term market solutions that will help enhance access. Um, and as a part of that, we anticipate undertaking a series of communications activities that would support that effort. Um, and then really all throughout this, but again at, at the early stage to begin connecting with activists and other key stakeholders who are in a position to advocate um, for these policy solutions in priority markets. So I, I will end there um, and happy to take any questions, but I am also really looking forward to working with this group more to help refine the focus of this effort in the coming months. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, I'd like to uh, now invite questions from the audience at this time. If you have a question for the panelists from either Depaigo or PATH, please select raise your hand icon next to your name. And once we've seen you've done so, we'll unmute you so you can ask the question. Um, you can also type a, que in a question in the question window at the bottom of your GoToWebinar dashboard. And, and there also someone will receive your questions and answer them for their group. Um, in case you don't have a very good audio connection, uh, make sure you, it's probably the best idea for you to type in your uh, question. And before we just open it up to question and answer, I did want to clarify one thing that I hadn't quite done before, which is in addition to the, the funding for the Reproductive Health Supplies Coalition for this work, um, it's actually this, Funding for these studies came from the MacArthur Foundation, which came to the Reproductive Health Supplies Coalition. So we'd like to extend our thanks to them as well. Um, with that, uh, we open up to questions. Okay, so um, while we're waiting for them to come through, one of the questions that uh, was asked earlier, uh, which is something that we can talk about now, which is the maternal health commodities that we have generally, and this is for both Selena and also for Caitlin, the maternal health commodity markets are actually quite small as you compare to um, some of the other markets, particularly within reproductive health supplies. Um, why do you think that, uh, given the numbers that you've shown, why do you think that there still is a case and a need to do market shaping um, for both these activities? So, Lena, maybe you can start, and then, Caitlin, could you please add to that? Yeah, you know, I guess um, this is Selena speaking. I'm not sure that I agree with the assessment that it is, a, um, it is a small, unattractive market because I think the feeling is if it was a small, unattractive market, we wouldn't have 500 different manufacturers that are manufacturing oxytocin. Uh, I think, you know, many of these generic manufacturers are able to adjust their, their production lines to make oxytocin if they get orders. Uh, and clearly they see that they can make uh, money by doing it. 
So uh, although the, vary, the sizes vary, um, we've definitely seen in some cases that we have market sizes in the you know, 25 to $50 million uh, range, which uh, you know, for a small manufacturer is actually quite a uh, you know, potentially lucrative uh, market. And what we would see if this wasn't a good business for them is that these manufacturers would get out of the business. Given that there are so many that are involved and wanting to manufacture these products, it clearly is attractive enough to them that they want to work there. Thanks, Thanks Selena. Selena. And just yeah. you know, from an advocacy perspective, I guess two points. One, that um, even in the case that there are small markets, there may be common policy solutions that can be applicable to multiple products and um, that we can really leverage advocacy to create that, that type of change that can affect multiple different products. At the same time, knowing that um, when we're talking about maternal health commodities, many of the market issues are with local markets, and so there may need to be some tailoring to, to advocacy approaches based on that. But I think even in the case where we're talking about smaller markets, there are certainly policy and advocacy solutions that we can improve. And I think, um, secondly, just that there is general need for awareness that when we talk about access to these issues. Those folks who are in the know know this, but at a broader level, it's important to focus on issues beyond just price. There are a multitude of issues affecting access, and I think raising awareness and dialogue around that is really important. Right. So also, that further moves the goals of healthy markets, which I think uh, is something that you were talking about. Um, we had a question from the audience. Jamie, could you please read it out? Yes, I actually got a couple questions, so I'll start with the first one here. Um, and this is related to the first presentation. Um, Sophia asks, hasn't the Concept Foundation been working to incentivize manufacturers of maternal health medicines to improve quality during the last couple of years? If so, how does this effort build on that work? Uh, so the question was about uh, work on incentivizing manufacturers. Yes, the work done by Concept Foundation. Right. Uh, I believe we have Concept Foundation. We have Hans Beamer on the line. Hans, would you like to comment on this one? Okay, I've just unmuted Hans. Oh, hi. Hi. Uh, Thanks. Thanks for the question. We have, uh, as Concept Foundation, not really been uh, incentivizing the manufacturers uh, to do this. What we have been doing is helping them to get to pre-qualification and uh, pointing out to them the, uh, the value of the pre-qualification. And I might say that in the last few weeks that we have been uh, using these uh, very good business cases uh, there's really a lot of uh, interest for that and, and manufacturers like that. Uh, the, as I said, we as Content Foundation have on, only, well only, have been helping them to get as close as possible to pre-qualification or to uh, a high uh, level in the um, expert review panel rating. I must say that if you talk about incentivizing manufacturers, that is important. But the thing I would like to add is that we have been very recently talking to a producer, a generic producer that's making a pretty good product that who is at this moment uh, producing high quality pre-qualified tuberculosis products, anti-tuberculosis products. And that gentleman was complaining that although his products have been pre-qualified for over three years now, he has still to see the first order for the pre-qualified product because the big procurers are still buying the, um, the uh, innovative product. So although I fully agree with all the points that uh, Selena made on how to shape the market and how to incentivize the manufacturers, we should not forget that we should definitely also in incentivize the procurers in telling them it is much better to pay a little bit more for a good product than pay a little bit less for a, a very bad product. Does that answer the question a little bit? Thank you, Hans. 
Uh, I think that's a good segue to take it back to Selena. So, you know, maybe you can talk about how uh, in the transition to the uh, the, set, the ideal market that you've uh, you outlined in your presentation, how that ultimately benefits manufacturers and procurers. Mm -hmm. I agree completely with the points that Hans made, and, and I, I think this is a, a real important issue for all of us to be working on, and I know that the, um, the MHTRT and the Maternal Health Supplies Caucus are, are working on these issues. Uh, up until recently, there hasn't been enough information provided to the large procurers of these products, uh, in many cases they are the ministries of health, um, about the quality issues. So we need to be doing quite a bit of work to understand what those quality issues are, to educate them about how to ensure the quality of their drugs, uh, and to help them to adjust uh, their regulations and policies. There's a number of recommendations that we made uh, in the business cases, and I know that the Concept Foundation, the MHTRT, the Maternal Health Supplies Caucus, and many other groups will be working this year um, to be doing some uh, uh, some outreach and education for those procurers um, so that they understand the value. And as Hans was saying, and, and I heard this as well when I spoke with manufacturers uh, during this business case um, analysis, they expect that the cost to uh, manufacture a product goes up about 5 to 12 percent uh, when they go through the pre-qualification process and to sell a pre-qualified product. And it does cost them money to go through pre-qualification, although there's, there's a number of incentives available. It does cost them money. And so we need to be prepared to support uh, those organizations and to make sure that if they go through that process and do what we're asking them for, that they will have a market. Uh, otherwise, we will not incentivize uh, more manufacturers to go through. And uh, there's a fairly strong uh, body of literature that says that you need to have um, you need to have a decent number, it you know, varies depending on the literature, but between about four and eight different manufacturers need to be selling a qualified, pre-qualified product um, in order to um, help the, the market adjust to the right price. So we really do want to be encouraging more manufacturers to go through this, this process. Thanks. Uh, Jamie, do you have another question from the audience? Yes, and uh, since we're on the issue of quality, uh, this question is a good follow-up. Um, so Jeffrey Jacobs asks, as a large part of the a large part of the intention is to entice manufacturers to improve their quality. Have you thought about providing a longer-term market size or forecast assumption? <laughs> Well, I think that's a, a very good question. Uh, we have um, we've provided a five-year uh, market forecast, uh, Jeff, and uh, it, it would be possible to um, to do more uh, forecasting uh, and to go further out than that. But there are a number of assumptions uh, in our current model, and we do think that it's possible that there's going to be some real differences over the next few years and some changes uh, in the way that these products are being procured. Um, so we only do have a, a five-year projection. Um, anyone can go into our um, into our Excel spreadsheets and try to model that out further, but but we have not done that yet. Um, I guess I'd also point out that the Excel spreadsheets that we have are really not a a forecast. They really tr attempt to show the size of the market, but what they don't do is show what the actual procurement numbers look like. We did some of that within the business cases themselves, and you can see that information. We are mostly only able to capture the procurement that is done by international organizations, uh, such as um, uh, UNFPA, UNICEF, and others. Uh, we were not able to capture um, all of the procurement um, that has been done by ministries of health. It's just very challenging to do. Um, so if we could have a way of gathering more of that information, I think the forecasting would become more accurate. That's a great question. Um, thank you. Uh, now, Jamie, I'm happy to one uh, Yes, and I think this could be for any of the panelists today. Um, we have a question from John Townsend who asks, what role would you like to see the global financing facility in expanding access to quality maternal health commodities? 
is the bank the most appropriate mechanism for improving the private market for these products in the least developing countries? Well, well that's a great question. Uh, in fact, John, I would like to hear your answer to that as well. Um, I, I think one of the most important things here is that this is a different kind of a market than a lot of the um, antiretrovirals, ACTs, and others in that the procurement is mostly happening locally. There is some international procurement and many of the ministries of health go to the UNFPA and to UNICEF and to others for help with procurement. But this is being procured by ministries of health and that makes it quite different. We, we consider the possibility that you could move procurement of these products to donors uh, for example, and that might help to improve the quality uh, of oxytocin and other products. But if you do that, we're really losing a sustainability angle in, in doing that, which is so important because we really want these ministries of health to be procuring these drugs. They're essential and the need is always going to be there for these products. So I'm, I'm not quite sure about the role that the global financing facility should be playing when we're encouraging that ministries of health would be procuring these products, uh, but I suppose there could be a role for the uh, GFF uh, in, in testing quality and improving and in encouraging pre-qualification. Caitlin, do you have thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that I'm just going to concur with what you, you've said already, um, that, that some of that broader, that that role exists around encouraging um, quality and incentivizing manufacturers in that way. Um, you know, and I'll also be really keen to see what comes out of the consultations that are happening in the near term. Um, I, I would like to add one thing to this, which is uh, one of the things that the global financing facility uh, can do is uh, encourage uh, sharing between various types of products and commodities to see if uh, for maternal health commodities, are there examples are there opportunities uh, to learn from more mature markets so that we can adapt and use certain interventions for maternal health commodities as well? And the other thing that comes to mind, of course, is also encouraging a more regional conversation. Uh, we've seen some examples come out in the past year where uh, regions have come together to do registration of both the malaria drug and uh, one of the mesoprostol drugs pre-qualified together. And what that really is, as one example, is, um, is opening the door to understanding, instead of just thinking about one country, one commodity, what are the groupings of countries and what are the groupings of commodities that we can do, all in all leading to a more efficient uh, way of approaching market shaping and also getting uh, commodity access out there. I think it's a good conversation to have, particularly because the financing facility will have um, multiple different groups uh, combining together on uh, a great perspective. I'd probably say that's also very similar to um, the role that the Reproductive Health Supplies Coalition can play, as well as, of course, UN Commission and um, the other convening groups that are out there working on these topics. Um, we have about two minutes left. Um, I'd like to finish it off on one final question, uh, which is about uh, if we move forward with some of the intended market shaping suggestions that are, um, that are listed in the business cases, and if we try and do that to talk about shifting, uh, or, or to talk about long-term market solutions to increase access, um, who are, you know, what are the best avenues for collaboration going forward within the coalition? Uh, what are some things that we can do within this year to continue those conversations and potentially um, at our next membership meeting? Hi, Deepthi. This is Anita. Hi, Anita. Um, just to take a first stab at answering part of your question, I think there are some partners within the coalition that have begun to think about the best ways of incentivizing suppliers to go for pre-qualification and by offering uh, financial incentives. They want to increase the
the pool of high quality manufacturers. And one of these is Financing for Development, and they're currently in discussion with investors as well as um, with other partners within the coalition to develop a mechanism. And we've asked them to present in February. So as a second part to this webinar, um, they'll be going into more detail about things that they plan to do this year and about how they want to increase that pool of quality assured manufacturers for these products. Okay, great. Um, with that, I think we are exactly at our hour mark. I'd like to encourage uh, those of you who are on this call in case you were not able to answer your, uh, get your question answered or have some subsequent thoughts to reach out to each of the three panelists. Um, our email addresses uh, are part of the um, uh, Save the Date invitation. And uh, so there's uh, Selena, myself, and Caitlin. And of course, we'll also reach back out to both the working groups uh, for any follow-on work that comes from this. Um, I'd like to again uh, say thank you to the coalition for giving us this opportunity. And uh, uh, look forward to seeing you all uh, sometime soon. <laughs>